it would be very beneficial to you to have the outline of the sermon. That's right. Get one for everybody. Have an outline of the sermon on Job because on the back of the outline is the outline of the book. Now, you can find many outlines of the book of Job, but if you want the best one, you've got it. <laughs> and it's not mine. Took it from David Dorsey, Outlines of the Old Testament, and uh, he's got the book of Job nailed. I'm convinced of it. We're kind of in the middle of this series. Certainly not giving a full-on exposition of Job, as one pastor did over a 40-year period, and the congregation dwindled throughout that 40-year trek through Job. We're just going to do about a dozen sermons, and we'll be, we'll be through Job. But turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Job 25. Job 25 is the last sputtering words of Job's friends as they seek to tighten the screws on him, hopefully cough up a confession from Job. Chapter 25, Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, Dominion and fear with God, he makes peace in his high heaven. Is there any number to his armies? Upon whom does his light not arise? How then can man be in the right before God? How can he who is born of woman be pure? Behold, even the moon is not bright, and the stars are not pure in his eyes. How much less man who is a maggot and the son of man who is a worm? Chapter 26, Job's reply, 1 through 3. Job answered and said, How you have helped him who has no power. How you've saved the arm that has no strength. How you've counseled him who has no wisdom and plentifully declared sound knowledge. Chapter 27, Job continues, 1 through 6. And Job again took up his discourse and said, as God lives, who has taken away my right, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips will not speak falsehood and my tongue will not utter deceit. Far be it from me to say that you are right. Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this book of Job and we receive it as your word to us, as a revelation from heaven to us. And it speaks to us of Christ. We pray may thy Holy Spirit now enable us to learn of Christ and of our great salvation in him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, Job is about a righteous man who, according to God's plan, must be tested by trial. And the testing by trial will be by God's own arch enemy, the devil, who would wish to thwart God's plan. Now, if you see Job as that's the storyline of Job, now you can project back and see that he's not the first righteous man to be tested by the devil. We look back and recognize that Adam was tested. Will his righteousness hold? But Job also looks forward to another righteous man, the second Adam, Jesus Christ. The first man, Adam, was placed in a pristine environment. Job and the second righteous man were placed into a fallen environment. 
A fallen environment embedded with strong evil forces as we have seen. The mighty behemoth, the mighty Leviathan, the plated dragon, the historically advanced evil work of the scaly serpent, deeply embedded and overshadowing the whole of creation. Satan's evil presence had advanced in the creation. So in all three cases, Adam, Job, or Christ, there is to be a victory over Satan if they are to secure righteousness and life, the higher life. In all three cases, righteousness is tested. Righteousness is tried of a weak, frail vessel of clay. So if you look on your bulletin to the back, a series of sermons have been working the outline. And uh, in this outline, there are five major parts. There's the letter A having to do with the suffering of Job in the beginning. Then there's A prime, A with a little number one by it, a little bit down, has to do with not Job's suffering, but Job's glory at the end of the book. And so we see that Job is structured with the themes of suffering and glory, and as such anticipates Jesus Christ, whose life is characterized by suffering and glory. As you move in on the outline to the letters B and B prime, you see those two match up with each other. Chapter 3 has to do with Job's perspective and wisdom on his life. Remember, cursed be the day I was born. <laughs> Versus when God appears in his theophanic presence, in 38 through 42, and now we get God's perspective on wisdom. The remarkable component, not only do these line up chiastically as literary pieces, but over 120 words, nouns and verbs, God rearranges from Job's own speech to use it against him. This is Logos language. We're words of Job are restated with true wisdom from Job's God. Then the letters C and C prime are the speeches. First in chapters 4 through 25 or 27, you have the speeches of Job and his three frenemies. Uh, frenemies is a new word that was invented by my son Ben, a little story that he wrote, and I thought, boy, that fits these guys. <laughs> Friends who aren't friends, <laughs> frenemies. Uh, and then the, the matching side of the speeches is this, the uh, Elihu speeches. So you got the C and C prime. And then the center of the book, chapter 28, is the little poem, the little soliloquy on where is wisdom to be found, which of course is, is the question throughout the book of Job. Where do we find wisdom? You know, where is it to be discovered? Well, 4 through 25, that section where his friends of comfort turns to fiends of accusation, where his counselors turn to prosecuting attorneys. I like to say his friends were nuthetic counselors gone to seed. Uh, if you're not familiar with nuthetic counseling, it was invented by Jay Adams in opposition to uh, let me off the hook by blaming my parents' psychology. Adams wanted to bear down the responsibility of the sinner to face his own sin and then deal with it by the grace of Christ. Nutheo means to confront. Well, uh, Job's friends were nuthetic counselors gone to seed. <laughs> All they could see lying behind Job's suffering was the unconfessed sin. So we find that uh, almost half the book, 4 through 25, 
has to do with the roundabouts and roundabouts and cycles with the three friends. In the beginning of the book, of course, Satan is unseen in the heavenly arenas to then come down in chapters 1 and 2, and then the unseen Satan, unmentioned Satan, through 4 through 25, is wearing his Bildad suit, uh, his Zophar suit, his Eliphaz suit, as the accusations roll. Now the gist of all these discussions occur on a distinctive moral canvas. God is in, here's the basic outlook, God is in control as creator. And again, as I mentioned before, nobody questioned whether God was in control. You read through the book of Job, your conclusion is, hmm, well, these guys were Calvinists ahead of time. No debate on that point. God is in control as creator. He rules in justice, and therefore he punishes evil and rewards the good. Simple, straightforward theology. And then even the righteous sometimes have a little evil that God needs to do his little spiritual Heimlich maneuver on and give them a squeeze so they'll cough out a confession. Now that's true too. But nonetheless... God confronts evil. Particularly will he squeeze out when necessary secret sin. So the friends arrive. They arrive with this theology as the moral canvas for this story. Job is already on the ash heap when they get there. What the friends do essentially over those chapters 4 through 25 is they reload Job up on the spit and begin to turn him again, relighting that ash heap. That every little speck and square inch of Job is under examination because somewhere there is to be found the dark underbelly and hiding sin. If he only confess, he can now be a free man again. Well, we know that theology is not sound, don't we? They're looking for the boogeyman of Job that isn't there. They're looking for the defect that is not to be found. Well, why then does Job suffer? Why does Job suffer? That's where the difference of opinion lies. The friends insist that Job suffers because there's sin. Look at the evidence. It's all mounting up around you. This is God's universe and everything is lined up against you as God would rightly line up against someone who had sinned. We just need to help Job find the chink in his righteousness. It's beyond all reasonable doubt that this is the truth of the matter. Job, on the other hand, says, I have not sinned. Uh, my conscience is clear. Why is God my adversary? I do not know. I don't know why my sunshine life turned into a Midwestern storm. But it has. I wish I could only have a day in court with God. To argue my case and have him explain to me all that is going on here. And there you have the two sides of the debate. We come to chapter 25, and we have Bildad's last arrow to shoot at Job. The mere six verses, shortest of them all, just because he's out of steam. When we come to chapter 25, this final speech from his frenemy, Bildad, there's no more long-winded speeches. They're all gassed. But Bildad comes up with this one final irrefutable error, arrow, rather, that certainly is going to stick in Job. Certainly this will poke a tiny hole in Job's armor of righteousness and finally bleed out a little confession. And so we come to 25. And what does Bildad argue? Bildad argues here that 
God is light. <laughs> He's majestically holy that even his own army in heaven uh, struggle with standing before him. Shines on them. And the luminaries of the sky, the sun and the moon, the luminaries of light, they're, they themselves are shaded before this holy being of light. Now, if that's the case, how much more man, that maggot, that worm, born of a woman? My ladies, don't take offense that Bildad said he was born of a woman, therefore he's evil. It had nothing to do inherently with a woman. It had to do with the fact that from generation to generation, what? Original sin was passed down, and he's the product of what's preceded. He's born sinful. So there's the argument. Job, look, uh, if, the, if the heavenly hosts uh, shudder before God, how much more man in his earthly life that has fallen have defect and, and have cause here to be aware of the gap? How can man begin to be right with a God like this? with a creature like this, before a God like this. So the unspoken point here is, you know, if you're following along in the storyline, the unspoken point is, Job, look, come on. Come on, Job, you're a sinner, right? you know. Job, you've got some material here to work with to form up a confession for us, Job. Don't you? Don't you? Come on. Now, if that were you, sitting there on the ash heap, and Bill Dad said that to you, what would you say? I know what I'd say. You got me. <laughs> I'm sure I forgot a couple of thank you letters in my life, and uh, I'm sure I shouldn't have eaten that second piece of pie, and, uh, you know, uh, you know I, I, I've been wishing for that addition to my house that I really don't need anyway. And, uh, yeah, you got me. You, you got me, man. I, uncle, thank you. Thanks for bringing it to my attention, the great gap between God and man. That's what I'd say. I'd roll right over. Because it resonates with us, doesn't it? But what should surprise us is what's the nature of Job's appreciation for this scintillating insight and the God's holiness in man's sin. Well, look at it. Now, just so you know, this drips with sarcasm. I know a person in my life that just hates sarcasm. Well, <laughs> here's a lot of sarcasm for you. How have you helped him who has no power? How you've saved the arm that has no strength. How you've counted him who has no wisdom and plentiful declared such sound knowledge. And uh, to press the sarcasm home, he backhands them on complimenting the wonder of it all. In other words, we would say, where did you find this stuff? Here's how Job puts it. With whose help have you uttered words? Whose breath has come from you? Wow, I'm impressed. It was like Job saying to them, hey man, you saved the day, you're my hero. Such profound wisdom's totally cleared up all my confusion. Whoa, where did you come up with that stuff? You got a main line to heaven? The Holy Spirit speaking to you right now? You might wonder, why did Job respond like that? <laughs> why did Job respond like that? We're going to find out in a minute why he responded like that. He goes on in the rest of the chapter to mention God's amazing majesty. And by the time he comes to verse 14, 
the end of the verse, he said, these are but the outskirts of his ways. In other words, as we see God in creation, his majesty revealed, his power on display, those are just the outskirts. Those are just the hem of the garment of who God is and what he's like. Job is saying, how small a whisper do we hear of him? In other words, look, within the midst of this fallen world, in the midst of this world in which we live, we can barely hear the whisper of God. And then Job would say, except for you guys, you've got a special receiving system, and it's all coming in loud and clear for you. He doesn't say that, but that's kind of where his spirit was at. At the end of the day, there's a lot we don't get. And, of course, Job would say, except for you three deep thinkers here. This was Job's response now. This is Job's response as he looks at the empty quiver of his friends. And he sits there as the proverbial pincushion of accusation. Job then responds. In chapter 27, 1 through 6. Job took again up his discourse and said, As God lives, who has taken away my right, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils, my lips will not speak falsehood, my tongue will not utter deceit. Far be it from me to say that you're right, Till I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. I call this Job's indefatigable righteousness. That word indefatigable is a multiple syllabic word. It's hard to say indefatigable, but it really describes Job's righteousness because it comes from the word fatigue, to be tired. And I don't know about you, but if I put myself in Job's shoes and I was in chapter 27, I would have just said, okay, certainly I've sinned in some ways. You're right. I'm wrong. God, have mercy on my soul. Just give up. But that wasn't Job indefatigable, tireless, through great trial, when everything's pointing against him, including the fingers of his three frenemies. Tireless. He begins by taking an oath in chapter 27, as God lives, that's an oath before God. As God lives, as long as I can breathe, as long as I can keep breathing. And of course, in this condition, it was questionable when that would stop. And the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. Job says, I'm going to tell the truth. I'm not going to come up with some phony baloney confession for you. I'm not going to lie and say, oh, I'm so guilty. I'm not going to do it, Job says. Because I'm not. So I won't. I can't. You can go ahead and twist my arm as long as you want. I'm not going to cry, Uncle. I'm not going to trump up a confession to satisfy you. You're not right. That's why. Verse 5. Far be it from me to say that you're right. If till I die. I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness. I will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. Positively, I am righteous. Negatively, my conscience does not dig into me. And he won't budge. So there it is. There it is, this amazing storyline, where in chapter 27 we end in this stalemate. 
this impasse. No light has been shed. No brilliant analysis offered here. No prophetic words have come blazing into the middle of these men's discussions and cyclical meanderings in trying to find wisdom regarding Job's situation. Wisdom remains elusive. But the three friends, they hold. God punishes the wicked and rewards the righteous. You are punished. Therefore, make confession. Certainly God will have mercy upon you, restore you to your former state. But on the other side of the courtroom rail stands the lonely Job. No, I've maintained a life of righteousness. My heart does not reproach me. There are no big blunders. You will find no rattling skeletons. I wish I could face my adversary in court. I'm mystified why this is happening to me. Now, interestingly, as we sit here today, many years later, having the entire book of Job before us, we know why he's suffering, don't we? Job's righteousness is shining out in the darkness of a fallen world as Satan surveys his domain. Old Leviathan, right? And God said, did you notice my servant Job? Job becomes a testimony that God's power in turning a child of Satan into a true child of God is called into question. And that God can make even more sure the righteousness of a sinner turned than of a righteous man initially created. Adam fell. Job did not. The new creation is stronger in making a saint secure than the old creation and its man of righteousness who fell. And remember, remember it was God who instigated this whole hothouse fiery trial. Remember, from where have you come? Oh, making surveillance, making a, a run over my domain. Hmm, well, happen to notice that bright star in the midst of the kingdom of darkness, Satan? The midst of your domain, shining out right over there? Job, my servant. Satan counters, you mean that chunk of fool's gold who only serves you because you've hedged in his life so comfortably? So the heat and light are brought to test the integrity of Job's righteousness. And it is tested. They take away his possessions and his progeny. They take away his health and dangle him over the jaws of death. And then, from chapters 4 through 25, half the book of Job, he is put on the spit and shot full of arrows. And Job's got nothing. He's got nothing but toast, abandonment, pain, mystified bewilderment, and his own righteousness, which he will not surrender. And here in this man of weakness, we find out and we know the storyline. He defeats Satan. He reconciles his friends. He reconciles his frenemies to God and he enters into a higher life than before from suffering to glory from weakness made strong that's Job and we sit back and we clap wow yay Job you made it But we're nervous. We're bugged. Is that the point? 
Is that the point then? Is that the point then? And when you're getting burnt and you're fired up, when you're rowing with one oar in the sea of madness and you look over the side of your dinghy and it looks more like the lake of fire than Lake Shasta, what do you do then? Now what? Well, your good nuthetic counselors will tell you, well, turn to Job. Hey, man, turn to Job. You're like Job. Just maintain a good conscience and walk in righteousness. Look to God. Don't turn to the right. Don't turn to the left. Maintain a good witness also. That's very important. And then like Job, then like Job, the Lord, he'll, he'll, he'll deliver you. He'll turn it all around. Oh, yeah, and don't forget... Uh, this great Bible truth. Uh, God never gives you more than you can handle. It, it, that great Bible truth comes right after the verse that says, God helps those who help themselves, doesn't it? Yeah, don't forget that too. Is that the point of Job? Is that what we want to take away? I, I'm tempted to enter into Job's sarcasm with regard to the error of his friends regarding the errors of interpreting Job, but I will not. That's not the point. The truth be told, Job is not for us fundamentally to point to and say, well, be like Job. Be like Job who could say, my heart does not reproach me for anything all my days. See, Job's anticipating Christ. Job is the one righteous man in a relative sense of the word pointing forward to a righteous man in the true, absolute sense of the word. He's anticipating another one coming at the end of days who in the last days who will come and through suffering sustain a perfect righteousness to club the devil, to clothe his suffering people and secure glory for them. So here's the closing thought. Here's the upshot of all this. When your kitchen is hot, and on your way out, you find that the doors are locked. What are you going to do? What you do is you stop. And you thank God that he's sanctifying you through this trial. He's teaching you about faith in the midst of the fire. He's teaching you about Christ-like attitudes and actions. Because you're in Christ. That's why you're in Christ. So don't get too stressed when you notice that your own personal garment of integrity is catching flame in the midst of all this. And the smoke of your own burning garments getting thick and choking you. Don't get all stressed about it. Don't get all stressed that... Uh, you found out that in tandem with the rising thermometer and that your friends and your family have also found out that you're just a sinner saint. Probably to their observation, your own conscience waited on the sinner side of the sinner saint combination. And don't try, don't try to white knuckle it like Job. I'm going to hold on to my own righteousness. You're going to get your fingers burnt at best on that one. Because it's very important, as we come to the end of this, it's very important to get this. It's very important to understand this. There is another who has passed through hell's kitchen ahead of you on his way to glory. A greater than Job. And guess what? He has left his cloak behind. He has left his cloak behind, which is an internally indestructible garment that has the stamp of heaven's approval on it. 
And in the lining of this cloak is the identity of its wearer. It says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Put on that cloak. You're safe. You're secure from all alarm. It's because of it that your father will say to you now, the flame shall not hurt you. I only design your dross to consume and your gold to refine. So let us pray.